Hello, my name is Eilish Hennessy, and you're very welcome to this webinar on positive parenting to support adolescent development. I'm a professor of developmental psychology in the UCD School of Psychology, and I am a I have a particular research interest in young people's mental health and particularly the stigma and discrimination that can be experienced by young people who've got mental health problems. In the context of this evening's talk, I'm particularly interested in the way in which stigma and discrimination can stop young people from seeking help. And I will refer to that uh, later on. So just by way of um, a brief introduction to a research project that we're going on at the moment, that's going on at the moment before I start my the main part of my talk, we are recruiting young people aged between 10 and 17 to take part in a study which is looking at the circumstances in which they believe a peer or a, someone their own age should seek help for a mental distress or a mental health problem. If you use the QR code here, you will be able to get information designed for parents about this project. And if you think it is something that you would be willing to allow your um, adolescent son or daughter to take part in, then you will find there a link that you can send on uh, to them to see if they are interested in taking part. And the reason for doing this will become more apparent as we go through this evening's uh, webinar. So in the, my talk uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about five different aspects of adolescent uh, development and the role of parents within that. Firstly, broadly speaking, what the changes associated with adolescence, then talk about the risks that adolescents uh, face, largely due to the many changes that are going on in their lives. I'm going to talk about supporting well-being through parenting, giving some suggestions for parents, and then talking a bit about parent self-care or the need for parents to be conscious that um, parenting an adolescent is actually quite difficult and that they need to look after themselves. So first of all, let me define adolescence and emphasize that there is no single definition of what it is. You will see uh, age groups spanning the teenage years to age groups spanning age 10 to 25, very broad. And that's because people define it not by uh, always by age, but by aspects of say independence or um, emotional autonomy. So for example, one definition you'll see is the time between puberty and independence from parents. Now, of course, in today's world, in Western developed countries, very often full independence from parents does not come until the mid twenties, say when um, third level education has finished. Um, and so um, that can make adolescence very long. Although I would say here that the, normally the age between eight, 18 and 24 is referred to as emerging adulthood to distinguish it from the more dependent uh, years of um, schooling. Another way to define adolescence is in terms of the, um, the way in which the individual has developed a sense of personal identity. So they've developed a kind of uh, personal freedom, a sense of who they are as distinct from their family, and that that is uh, a way of helping them to become a healthy adult. So Again, you can see that the age band for that can vary very significantly. Four different changes associated with adolescence that I'm just going to speak to each of these in turn, the physiological, the cognitive or reasoning abilities, emotional um, autonomy and social role expectations all of these in their own way are hugely important and they all interact with one another as well within the individual. So firstly, the physiological changes, of course, these are the most uh, immediately apparent in relation to adolescence. So a growth spurt that starts with um, hands and feet getting bigger. Of course, it's feet we noticed most because um, new shoes are regularly needed, but that's typically followed by growth in the um, arms, legs, trunk and chest. So growth is very rapid. Um, in, in adolescence, although the time at which it starts will vary substantially from one adolescent to another. 
Other changes include the deepening of the voice. We think of this uh, very much associated with young men, but of course, young women as well also have a, a deepening of their, their voices, maybe not as marked as it, as it is in, in young men. Development of secondary sexual characteristics. So again, you'll see th this is um, one of the more physically obvious changes that takes place during adolescence. And for some will be a mark of pride and will make them feel mature and grown up. But others can find the physical changes happening in their body quite challenging if they are shy and so on. The whole process for most young people is completed within about three to four years. But I really want to emphasize that these are very significant changes and that therefore it's not surprising that young people become more concerned about their appearance, their um, because their appearance has changed so dramatically. And that is something that I'm going to that I will come back to. Advances in reasoning ability. Um, with greater ability to think logically, to think systematically, and to consider abstract concepts. Obviously, these are very important for schoolwork. Um, and that's shown by the more advanced curriculum that it's possible to have in, in secondary school. But of course, this logic and systematic thinking and abstract concepts are equally applied to the young person's um, consideration of their social relationships, of their relationships within the family. And so it's this is a time for much greater scrutiny of themselves, maybe much better ability to compare themselves with other people. It also means that they're going to be much more um, thoughtful about the physical changes that are happening within their bodies. So it's not just that your body is changing, it is that you have a new way of thinking about the changes in your body. And of course, that makes the change even more uh, profound and more meaningful for the young person. Emotional autonomy also grows during um, adolescence. This is um, important as a marker of a movement towards the identity and uh, personal autonomy of adulthood starts by seeing parents as fallible and human. Now, of course, for parents, that's a big change because typically younger children see parents as infallible and superhuman. They see their parents as definitely the very best parents in, in the world. And of course, that changes with adolescence. But nonetheless, it's a very important and positive change because, of course, the only way that um, your children can have mature adult relationships with you is if they acknowledge your humanity. And that acknowledgement of your humanity as a, a parent also means that they acknowledge that you too can make mistakes just as they do. We see that in adolescence, there is a greater willingness or a greater um, desire to work things out for themselves. So this can be um, from emotional problems, Emo emotional issues that come up for them, but it can also be, you know, to get a job in order to save up money to um, take a holiday or to pay for something that, that, that they would like. So this desire to be more self-reliant is very valuable and it's a very important uh, development of adolescence, but nonetheless, we can see it applied in um, a way that is not useful and that's very much feeds into why we're doing the research project that I described at the beginning of this uh, webinar, because that research project is interested in the fact that young people tend to be less likely than older people to seek help if they are experiencing um, a personal mental health problem. And we believe that some of that may at least be linked into the fact that very often um, adolescents have a preference for trying to work things out for themselves. And of course, sometimes we know that that's not the most appropriate thing to do, that they may sometimes really benefit from getting help either from uh, a parent or indeed from a professional. Um, the third growth of emotional autonomy is feeling more of an individual in relationship with parents. So typically we think of children as having a, um, a sense of identity that is very much subsumed within the family identity, seeing themselves primarily as a member of a family and in relationships with um, family members. 
adolescence sees a much greater sense of wanting to be an individual in your own right. And that may mean having um, feelings and and um, uh, insights and beliefs that are different from other family members. We also see that adolescence is a time of growing importance of the peers, peer group for social support. Now, the importance of peers begins to emerge in adolescence. And of course, our, our relationship with our peers is some of the most important relationships for our lives. Um, your peer group is your um, group of uh, in your neighborhood, in you know your work colleagues and so on. So it's really important to learn to get on with um, your peers. And so this is really an important learning point for adolescents and some will do it more quickly um, than others. My apologies, this is um, jumping around. So the second change that, uh, or another change that I refer to is a change in social roles in, in adolescence. And this is maybe involve things like taking on part-time work um, and learning about the world of work from, from that. Again, a very important life lesson to learn and one that many young people will hugely benefit from. Um, another way of taking on additional responsibility and learning about commitment to others is by volunteering. And there we see very often that schools are very good at engaging young people in doing voluntary work within uh, communities. The other change in social role that I would emphasize is one that is less positive for young people because that has to do with the extent to which society is more negative in its attitudes towards adolescents and teenagers than it is towards children. So children are typically viewed much more positively in the media. Um, whereas adolescents can be treated in um, a more suspicious way. And of course, this is something that is uh, no doubt communicated to young people and one which can make them feel less positive about themselves and how they are portrayed within um, the, the, the world around them and how society responds to them. The other point, of course, is that adolescence, as I've already mentioned, because of the physiological changes, marks a change from being from the immaturity, uh, the physical immaturity of childhood to the sexual maturity of adulthood. And this can mean that for young people, they detect a difference in how people respond to them, particularly if they look older than they are. And while some people may find, some young people may find that quite um, a, a positive experience, others may find that quite difficult to cope with. And indeed, um, if you're shy or um, in any way concerned about your own uh, body image, then that can be a very difficult experience to go through. For all of for the reason of all of those changes, we know that many of the studies that have been uh, done on the way in which adolescents evaluate themselves, we see that over the course of adolescence, personal evaluation of your own abilities and your own worth tends to decrease. So these this graph is showing findings from the My World Survey 2 conducted by Barbara Dooley in the UCD School of Psychology in conjunction with Amanda Fitzgerald. And here we're seeing the top kind of purple line is showing um, personal competence over the school years from first year through to sixth year. And the green is showing the um, girls changes in social senses of competence over the same time period for growth, both groups, you can see there that there is a drop in feeling of competence over those school years, even though objectively, these young people are massively increasing in their competence. So their schoolwork, they're learning all sorts of new skills all of the time. So it, this is really showing us what the impact of adolescence is having on their personal sense of self. Now, I also want to highlight that the, the um, this is a you know, a, a graph that has been cut off so that it only starts there at number 25 at um, a score of 25 and goes up to a score of 30. So the drop in score for the for the males is uh, around about uh, one point out of um, 30 on the, the, the total score. For the females, it's a bit more. It's a drop of 12 points. But nonetheless, it's not the enormous drop that you might think if the scale was starting at um, zero. So just to say that, yes, there is a drop, 
but it's perhaps this this graph might lead you to think it's larger than it is. But nonetheless, it is the case that young people appear to feel less competent the older they get. We also see comparable drop in self-esteem, um, although you can see there that by fourth year, there's a, it's bottoming out so that we're seeing a, a, a flatter uh, base to the, the uh, graph here. Um, again, noting that the bottom part of the x of the y axis has been removed, so that this is a drop from of about two points from twenty a score of twenty eight to a score of twenty six. But nonetheless, again, it is showing that in terms of how they value themselves, young people are feeling less good the older uh, they get. How do young people cope when they experience difficulties with um, stress? Well, you see here that friends are by far uh, are, are one of the top three ways of coping that young people have reported again in the My World survey. So 56% of them say that friends are an important way of helping them to cope. 54% refer to listening to music. And of course, we know that an increased interest in, in, in music very often goes with um, adolescence. And sport and exercise also seen as very important. And again, remember that one of the bonuses of sport and exercise is how very often that is done in conjunction with one's uh, peer group. So I want to emphasize that, th that this again is um, further evidence of the importance of the peer group during adolescence. You see family, uh, particularly if you combine wider family and parents remain important. You know, if you were to add family and parents together there, you come up with 50% um, say that um, family, is, family including parents is, is important, but nonetheless, that's still uh, slightly less than the importance of friends in coping with uh, stress over the course of adolescence. So adolescence is a time of substantial change. Because of that, there are lowering feelings of competence, lowering feelings of uh, self-worth. So those are among, um, and those feed into many of the other challenges that are faced by young people. And I want to talk about four challenges in particular, decision-making, the ability to postpone gratification, um, the, as the some of, sometimes the difficulties in establishing uh, peer relationships and maintaining positive mental health. So firstly, what do we know about risky decision-making? Well, we now know thanks to far more um, advanced techniques for looking at the functioning of the brain. So using things like uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which is able to have images of the working brain. That tells us that parts of the prefrontal cortex, which is that part of the brain involved in, are more reasoned and more advanced types of uh, thinking ability, that those are not fully mature until around 25 years of age. And very often that has, uh, or the implication of that is that the ability to plan, the ability to um, uh, master oneself and act in a reasoned way is not fully mature until about uh, age 25. Linked into that is the fact that the peer group is um, at times um, associated with greater risk taking in adolescence. So this has been demonstrated in a number of um, tasks that have been, you, you get young people to perform a task, in this case, uh, a, a simulated driving task, but others are undertake other types of tasks are taken as well. And if you have a task in which it's possible to take risks, then what you find is, that um, adolescents on the whole are more likely to take risks when they're with peers than when they are on their own. And again, that suggests to us that you can get this risky decision-making over the course of adolescence. Now, I would also point out that that's, you know, there are lots of times as well when the peer group may act to curtail risky decision-making, but we nonetheless need to see that decisions are being influenced by the peer group and that, that is important. And um, we know as well from research evidence that rewards may be more salient for adolescents. So um, adolescents seem to be 
um, much more focused on the prospect of gaining a reward than um, many adults are. And so this may lead them to being uh, particularly influenced by the possibility of something positive about to happen, regardless of, of what they're um, about to do. So almost like the, the, the potential for the end uh, to justify the means. And of course, we know that for young people, with the peer group being very important, gaining esteem in the light of your peers can be a very rewarding thing. So that's probably linked into some of the risky decision-making in the context of the, the peer group. Adolescents also, um, particularly in early adolescence, we see um, that there is a less ability to postpone gratification. Um, so, we, I mean, we know that people vary between, you know, uh, there's a lot of individual variation in adults and how well they're able to postpone gratification. But nonetheless, we know that this is more difficult in, in adolescence. And this leads to a lot to uh, it being more common to have short term thinking. So that inability to get down to work now in order to um, do uh, the revision for an exam because the payback for doing well on the exam means postponing the gratification of being able to go out with your friends now or to uh, get engaged in a sport or, or whatever. So it leads to more shorter term thinking of during adolescence than, than in adulthood. A further challenge for young people is the um the the establishment of positive and supportive peer relationships. Now, from for most young people, um establishing peer relationships is going to happen. Um, they're they are going to learn to get on well with their peer group, they are going to develop um friendships. But what I would point out is that. The, the challenge here is that, of course, adolescents are going through a time of significant change, as I've highlighted. And that means for any given young person, a lot of their friends may be a experiencing significant uh, challenges as well. So that can mean at times that there, there can be ruptures in the peer group, that young people may fall out with their friends for various reasons. And that can be extremely distressing for young people because the peer group is so important to them. And so that's um, important to bear in mind that for many young people, there will be times over the course of adolescence when um, the peer group is not there as an adequate support for them. What I would say is that all you can do is try to be supportive, try to ensure that they have enough activities that bring them into contact with a range of different peers so that um, in the hopes that they will in time uh, maintain or, or establish new or that the old relationships uh, will begin to function well for them again. We also uh, know that um, adolescence is a time when we see a greater emergence of mental health challenges. So the group, the bars highlighted in this chart here are from the age of 10 up to the age of 24. But you'll see here that it's between the ages of 10 and about 19 that we're seeing the steepest growth curve in um, problems associated with mental health. This also in includes um, substance use, but the both we see growths in both of those independently. So we know that mental health challenges are emerging over the course of adolescence and that uh, many young people will go through a time of significant distress and therefore understanding that distress and finding ways to encourage young people to seek support when they are distressed is extremely uh, important. And that's what, what the research project that I mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar is, is, is all about. What I didn't mention in the um, in any of the challenges that I've um, highlighted so far is social media. Now, of course, talking as I do to many parents, um, both professionally and as well through my um, 
you know, my own family and friends. I know that parents a lot of the time are very concerned about the use of smartphones, about engagement with social media. What I would say is that at the moment, we are still only at a time of emerging evidence on the way in which uh, young people's mental health is associated with social media use. So just because we're seeing um, increases in uh, mental health uh, difficulties in young people at the same time as we are seeing a growth in the use of uh, smartphones and social media doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. Uh, so we need to be very clear about that, that the fact that two things change at the same time does not necessarily mean that, that, that one has caused the other. We need more research which follows young people over time. I would call that a longitudinal study, but it's, it's uh, data that... Um, is tracking young people to see um, how their mental health emerges over the course of adolescence. And of course, that's a much more difficult uh, study to do than the types we typically see published, which are um, what are called cross-sectional studies. So these are literally snapshots of young people um, and their media use at, at, at different age groups. So um, although this is uh, showing us the potential for a, a, a developmental pattern, nonetheless, it is not proving a, a causal relationship. We also see that a lot of studies that report links between social media use and uh, mental health during adolescence uh, averages mental health use, uh, or, sorry, mental health um, disorders or mental health difficulties and social media use right across the years from 13 to 18. And yet, of course, we know that there are huge differences between 13 year olds and 18 year olds in terms of their maturity, in terms of their interests in life, their um, independence and so on. So averaging those may be disguising or hiding many important nuances about differing impacts of um, social media at different age groups. And then the final gap within the research is that um, we, I've seen very little research on that has really focused in on what young people are doing on their smartphones and, and how they are using social media. So you can use your smartphone um, to, to simply look at, at videos all day, which uh, would clearly not be the most desirable use, but you might also be doing you know, uh, research for a, um, a, a project for a school, you might be playing chess, you might be um, doing crosswords. So the, the potential to um, engage in different activities on smartphones is significant. And we don't yet have a great deal of data on the way in which differential use of different activities on smartphones is differently um, related to, to young people's well-being. So it's not that I'm saying there's, there's no harm in uh, phone use or uh, social media use. What I'm saying is I don't think that researchers can yet give definitive answers of the type that parents would like to have about um, uh, the, the impact that social media or smartphone use is having on young people. So I want to move now to talking a bit more about parenting in, in adolescence. I've spoken so far primarily about the changes associated with adolescence, those physiological reasoning, uh, changes in autonomy and social role, as well as the risks associated with adolescence, such as risks in decision making, postponing gratification and mental health difficulties, and how all of those mean that we need a new approach to parenting in the adolescent years. So four things that I, I, I want to emphasize, encouraging independence while maintaining consistent control. So that's always going to be challenging. It's hard. Uh, to know when exactly it's you should allow a young person to make um, a decision for themselves. And I have I think I have a slide about that in a, in a moment. You want to encourage the development of critical thinking skills and independent judgment. So um, encouraging them to think deeply about the consequences of um, uh, what their their, their actions um, and to be able to make an independent judgment based on those um, that thinking. 
encouraging them to develop a sense of personal identity, even where they're, they seem to be developing a set, you know, beliefs that are very different from your own, because of course we need them to have a sense of their own uh, sense of being an individual. And the only way to do that is to allow them to um, think for themselves and to come up with their own decisions about um, how they want to, um, the, the beliefs they have and their attitudes to, to various um, uh, societal issues. Um, and so then finally, to be authoritative, which is to be responsive, but also demanding. So to be aware of the strengths and limitations of each adolescent, but also to be expecting um, that they will behave in um, appropriate ways uh, when, when required. So how can we encourage independence in, in adolescence? Well, firstly, I, so I have a slide on each of these communications and how enhancing self-esteem and encouraging responsible decision making. Well, firstly, a communication and I emphasize communication constantly. It's so important to have as good a channel of communication as you have can have with an adolescent, even though it's a difficult time to communicate with them. So I would say. First of all, ensure that you have something to communicate about. Now, for some people, that's very easy. Parents and children may uh, share a passion for um, particular sports, and maybe that may be a, a quick channel for communication. Um, but for others, that may be more difficult. You may not share many of the interests of your uh, teenage son or daughter. But I would say, please do try it then and take an interest in the things that are of interest to them, whether that's their music, um, uh, the sport that they're engaged in, um, because by taking an interest in it, by asking them, by finding out more, you immediately have something that you can talk to them about. And that gives you a wonderful conversation opener uh, to engage in, in conversation. Adolescents are, as again, as part of communication, you need to think about uh, what adolescents can at times say to that, it, that are likely to provoke parents or to distress uh, parents in a variety of ways. I would say that it's very important, regardless of what is said to you, to try to respond in a way that it is it, that is as calm as you can be. Um, th th some saying something like, "I understand why you." might think that that's not what I have found or that's very interesting have you thought of how that might affect a or b or person a or b so those kind of reactions have have numerous positive consequences firstly they diffuse a situation that could otherwise have ended up in in um a row so if a young person says something that is um inflammatory or or upsetting by responding in kind, you ensure that the situation will escalate. This is a way to de-escalate a situation and to try to keep communication uh, more open. Um, the other thing is that when a lot of the time when things are said that um, are, are upsetting to parents or provoking to parents, they may, they're not necessarily about life's major issues. They can be about quite trivial things. And in which case, if you oh, if you react strongly to something that is not particularly uh, major, um, you are going to deter the young person from telling you about something very serious that is concerning them, because they may be worried that they will upset you or concerned at the the type of reaction that they will um, get from you. So really important if you can to to stay as calm as you can um, in in response to uh, things that are said to you. I would also always recommend giving very clear directions or instructions. So young people are very good at um, not, you know, not listening to, to, to get the full meaning of what you're saying. And of course, you may have very particular reasons why you need a particular activity to be done. And so never give instructions that have any potential for misinterpretation. So the example I've given here is when you finish your homework, please put out the bin. It's completely full and it's beginning to smell. So you've, you've given a reason for why you're asking for the activity and you've been very clear what the activity is rather than simply hinting that the bin is full. 
Enhancing self-esteem is very important. I showed you a graph showing how self-esteem tends to drop over the course of adolescence. And that's something that you want to try to bolster, point out when performance has improved. Now, performance, you know, whether that's academic or sporting or um, in terms of social engagement may not be where you would like it to be. But nonetheless, if you've seen a positive change, comment positively about it. And um, that is going to help the young person's self-esteem. Um, remember that appearance is likely to be um, an obsession. And as I say, it's a perfectly natural obsession. When, you're, when your body is changing very rapidly, it's quite natural that it would be a source of fascination for you. Um, however, if you have already watched um, Dr. Kira Mann's um, webinar on body image, uh, which was the first in this series of, of webinars, and if you haven't, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at that. It's an excellent uh, webinar. Uh, she cautions against an over um, emphasis on Co po positive commenting on appearance by, by parents. So she says, look, appearance, you, you want to make sure that you are praising a wide variety of um, things that young people do and not just um, how they look. So ensure that you're commenting when they're kind, when they're generous, uh, when they've done something helpful, when their academic work has improved, when their sporting prowess has improved. Keep a range of uh, keep your praise across a range of things they engage in um, so that they don't be so that they don't end up seeing how they look as uh, being the most important thing. And then uh, thirdly, recognize growing expertise in an area. So some young people will really become quite experts at some uh, activity they engage in or some um, you know sport that they're interested in, um, whether that's, you know, following a, a sports team or whatever, they will almost certainly know a lot more than you do about that topic, unless it happens to be of particular interest to you as well. So acknowledge that, you know, to, it gives you something to comment on to say, my goodness, you know, you really do know a lot about this and that's that's fantastic. So it's, it's um, acknowledge that they have a growing sense, that they have a growing expertise in, in an area. Encourage responsible decision making. Now, I've already said that this is quite a difficult thing to do because you really do have to make a judgment call and that nobody can tell you uh, how to do that or whether you're making the right uh, call or not. You have to base it on your experience with that young person, how they have behaved in the past. What are the risks involved in a situation? But I would say in broad terms, the idea is to allow the greatest level of autonomy possible when the risk is at its lowest. So and then increasing your level of um, regulation as risk increases. But as I say, unfortunately, there is no definitive hard and fast rule for saying when it's when it's right to allow them to make a decision um, by themselves. But I would trust your own judgment on that. Try not to use uh, scare tactics. And by scare tactics, I mean um, suggesting that there will be totally disastrous consequences if they do something or fail to do something. So, you know, suggesting that failing an exam is going to be the end of the world um, or that it's going to have far more serious negative consequences than it actually will have. Again, the, the reason for that is that if you do suggest that something really terrible is going to happen as a consequence of something they do, and they discover that that's not the case, then, you know, you have blown your own credibility in terms of your ability to say what the negative consequences of something are likely to be. Um, and so, you know, be, be, be careful, really try to ensure that you give rational and reasoned reasons for why you want them to behave in a particular way, either to do something or to avoid doing something. Um, always ask them uh, where they're going and who they will be with and ask them to tell you if their plans change. Now, of course, you know, I'm sure um, lots of young people a lot of the time will not give, certainly won't give the whole truth in, in, in what they're saying. You just have to accept that. But 
what I would say is all of the research suggests that by um, asking them to tell you and by asking who they will be with, you are reducing um, the the um, level of risky behavior that um, most of the time you'll find you will get truthful answers um, and that that commitment to a plan is one that is more likely to make the young person continue to follow through on that uh, plan. And um, some additional suggestions here, I would say, try as far as possible to stay open minded and non judgmental about the dis the um, opinions that a young person has. So we know that prevailing public opinion changes from generation to generation. You are not going to hold exactly the same opinions as, as your uh, son or daughter, but try to be accepting of their decisions. You can point out why you do not um, hold the same opinion, um, but nonetheless, acknowledge their right to hold an opinion that is, that is different uh, from, from your own. Humor can be a great um, um, de-escalator of situations if you can find a way to be self-deprecating or to make a joke about um, something that will lighten the situation. That can also be um, very useful. I would also suggest, um, now not in the heat of an, an argument, but just there are times when it can be useful to, to ensure that young people are aware of really how lucky they are, just as we all should be at a time when the there is a great deal of, um, when the world is experiencing a great deal of change and when lots of people are experiencing um, appalling suffering, um, we do need to understand that we are really in a very lucky position in, in Ireland uh, today, or, or, or most people are. I want to acknowledge how difficult it is to parent a teenager and obviously some teenagers it's more difficult to parent than others if you've got more than one child you will be fully aware of that um you know it, it's not just that teenagers can at times be uh, challenging and um, and can be moody but sometimes they can evoke for a parent the difficult feelings that they themselves had as teenagers you may not be conscious of that, but if you think about it, you may be aware that some of the feelings that um, are being expressed or some of the you know concerns that the young person have may resonate with you in a way that makes you feel bad. So be aware that that may be an emotional reaction that you're having. Sometimes also we see that teenagers' um, behavior can remind us maybe of a sibling or of one of our own parents and maybe they call to mind difficult relationships that we had with that person. Again, that can set, that can mean that um, that makes dealing with a diff, uh, you know, challenges from a teenager even more difficult because you have these other um, history of interactions with somebody who behaves in a similar way, uh, weighing down upon you. So be conscious that that can also add to, to some of your own challenges um, as a parent dealing with the situation that you're faced with. Um, I therefore would always recommend that you find something positive to do for yourself, to do with your partner. It's really important to, to um, be aware that you are almost certainly being stressed by this uh, parenting process, Find things that you can do that you enjoy doing or that you enjoy doing as a couple um, and do those just to have time for yourselves to build up uh, your own resilience um, to to enjoy something um, and not to be constantly um, caught up in the worries of, of parenting an adolescent. There's no way you are ever going to be a perfect parent. There is no such thing as a perfect parent. You will... Um, at times blow up you will at times make a wrong decision in terms of wh whether you you know when when you allowed them to make um a decision and afterwards realized you shouldn't have allowed them to do that or the other way around there's no such thing as a perfect parent you just have to hope that you are good enough that's that's what we should aim for as parents to be good enough in that we are uh, being supportive as we can be as loving as we can be as caring as we can be but we certainly won't end up being perfect
If you're interested in reading more and interested in reading um, a, a kind of more um, scientific and research-based account of um, adolescence and the changes associated with adolescence, I think you know this is a really good book. Sarah Jane Blakemore writes really well. She is a uh, you know um, a, a neuropsychologist who has written a lot about the developing brain. This is very much written for um, uh, parents, and it is about the wonderful opportunities of adolescence as well as the challenges of adolescence. Um, it's I'm, I'm sure it's widely available in libraries. I discovered that it's um, if you have an Audible subscription, it is um, one of the free one of the, the free books that comes with an Audible subscription. You might want to look at it. It's quite nicely read as well. Um, I looked at, at it for on Borrowbox, which is the um, audio book for the my local library. I couldn't find it there. Um, but again, in hard copy or in, you know, uh, the, the the physical book will be able to be ordered from, from your local uh, library. So I would strongly recommend that you have a look at that. It's a very, very interesting uh, read. I'm just putting up this slide with some support services uh, for parents and teenagers. I'm sure that you are familiar with many of them. Jigsaw is, is the um, national... Um, support service for youth mental health. Belong To is a specialist uh, service to provide support for young people who are LGBTQI. Um, um, so again, those young people who are questioning their sexuality may have very specific needs and Belong To is an excellent support service for them. BodyWise, a wonderful support for young people experiencing body image issues. They also have excellent an excellent website with great resources for parents. Spun Out is um, it's a resource for young people rather than for parents, but nonetheless, it has fantastic information that you could point the young person, your um, son or daughter, to everything from uh, menus, you know, how to various uh, recipes, through to voting, through to mental health. And they're very careful that all of their um, articles are really well researched. Parentline is um, offers specific support and advice uh, to parents of children of all ages. And Parents Plus um, has a range of parenting programs um, and, and that which are which are really excellent and again have been well tested to ensure that they really are supportive for, for parents. Again, excuse me, just to remind you that we are seeking um, parents who will give permission for uh, a son or daughter to take part in our research project. You can find out more about it with this QR code. And then if you think it's something, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, you would be willing to allow your son or daughter to take part in, um, when you use that QR code, you will find from there a link that you can send on to um, the, your, um, the, your, your son or daughter. Just want to thank you for your attention uh, throughout this um, webinar. I end with this quotation that I've always found um, very nice by, for, by Mark Twain. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to 21, I was astonished by how much he'd learned in seven years. And I think for many of us, that sums up some of the changing relationships that happen between parents and children over the course of adolescence and into um, emerging adulthood. So I'll leave it there. Thank you again. And um, if you uh, haven't already explored some of the other resources on our website, please do have a look. We've got a wealth of videos there for parents um, that they can use.